One of my favorite stations on satellite radio is 90s on 9, which is uh, now a classic station for all intents and purposes. But the <laughs> only reason I bring it up is because even though my heyday is ancient, uh, the idea that this weekend the Yankees are in first place, the Knicks are a two seed, we're talking about Conan O'Brien and O.J. Simpson and Saturday Night Live. And I'm like, this is the 90s. It's the, the 90s are back. The, 90, the <laughs> 90s over the weekend. I, I really enjoyed the number of people who seemed to be uh, kind of discovering Conan O'Brien. I... I don't know how some of this stuff happens, where it is that you age out on things, and there's a whole generation, Stugatz, that has no access to Conan O'Brien being on mainstream television. because, And that guy makes nothing but good things. Everything that he puts his name on is good. He's got a Mac show. I, I could make the argument that he is as good as any late-night show host ever, that they have all since desecrated it since he left, but that he was as good as anybody, and now he's getting a lot of love because of uh, his Hot Ones appearance where he just dedicated himself to the idea of comedy. Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Lebertard Show. More famous Conan, the comedian or the barbarian? Wow. Great question. Izzy Gutierrez is here, and I'm happy about this because this is the loudest day that I can remember around the Knicks since that one playoff game they won against the LeBron, Wade, Bosch, Heat, and Confetti fell from the ceiling. They won 50 games, which everyone in town in Miami makes fun of winning 50 games, but it's a big deal that New York has won 50 games, and they sneak into the two seed because DeMar DeRozan can't hit a, a shot late, one of the best clutch players in the league, couldn't hit a shot late in Madison Square Garden. I love that Nick fans were actually having the argument of what seed they wanted to have. They didn't want the two seed, they wanted the three seed, they wanted the four seed, they should have lost that game. It was a bad win in overtime at home. You know what? There was a basketball game being played, and Tom Thibodeau wanted to win that basketball game. He does not care. And I love that about Thibs, but I'll probably blast him five games from now. You, uh, you won't like it in six games because <laughs> Sixers and Heat are both bad matchups for the Knicks. This is what I love about Stu. I have not heard Stu give a passionate Knicks take in years, and the first one he offers is they should have lost that game. I didn't say it's that. Amazing. I didn't say it. I said I love I that I have a coach and a player in Brunson that doesn't want to lose that game. They want to win that game. They want the two seed. They don't care who they play. Okay, They, may, they might in five they, games, they, though. They might want to win the game, but DeRozan was shooting for the game at the end, no matter how much they wanted to uh, win it. One of the things that I wanted to point out, Izzy, what do you do with this? Because the Miami Heat have been an unusual team all year. And on the road, they're one of the best teams in the league. They're 24 and 17 on the road. That's what Denver is, Stugatz. That's what OKC is. Mm -hmm. Boston's a little bit better than that on the road. They've got an enormous game against Philadelphia. You want to win that game and play the two seed. You do not want to play Boston first. They're not going to be afraid of Boston, but you don't want to play Boston first. You're a little rather nervous, Dan. Jeremy just smacked his hands together, Mr. Miyagi style. He's very excited about me being here as his ally, which Finally. I'm very happy to be his ally, but that's Why? not the vibe that I want right now, Jeremy, because this is not yeah. really this time is not for Miami time. Heat yet. Okay, it is not that time yet. Like The idea that this team can recreate that, first of all, they're begging they are dying for that seven seed. They do not want to face Boston in the first round and be their first victim. They will probably get swept. I'm going to say that right now if they face them in the first round. But if you suddenly fall to two, or fall to seven rather, and face the Knicks, mm -hmm. I mean, this whole idea, I've been talking about this recently, like the NBA has changed. You don't have two or three championship contenders anymore. You have several, and they sort of treat the regular season a little NHL style, where it's like, we don't care where we finish. We got a great coach. We got players. This is what we're going to do in a seven-game series. They feel like they have a chance. And I think it's not just the Miami Heat. It's a lot of these teams. It's all of these teams that don't really worry about their seeding, except for, uh, you know, Stugatz's Knicks there. So I do think right. that the Heat have an opportunity to repeat that. But the funny thing is everybody points to play playoff Jimmy. After playoff Jimmy does what he does every single year, what do we say? Get him a little more help because he needs a little bit. They've gotten him more help 
offensively anyway, than they ever have. And so if they're going to do what they did last year, it's kind of less of a surprise because he has more help around him now. I don't uh, think that Milwaukee minds that such a big deal is being made of the fact that the Knicks climbed up to 50 wins in the two seed and quietly Doc Rivers gets to sneak in as a three seed. How do you finish third? How do you finish behind the Knicks if you're the Milwaukee Bucks adding Damian Lillard? Well, Giannis is hurt. No, but this I mean, is just the last couple of games. He hasn't been right. hurt all season. It's That's just fair. the last couple of games that he's been hurt. And he played the five before that that they lost to bad teams before he got hurt. And now he's going to play, the Bucks are going to play the Indiana Pacers team that, if yeah. you remember, during the regular season kind of owned them. Uh, Tyrese Halliburton kind of felt like it was, you know, his show against that team. I, I consider him, I think I said this at some point, he is the more impactful superstar than Damian Lillard right now, Tyrese Halliburton. And now they've got to face them in the first round. Like, that's, that's scary for Milwaukee. And, you know, Doc Rivers is getting everything everybody wanted to see him a little spin for you, Dan. A team letting go of their head coach midway through the season, getting the three seed. Kind of impressive if you look at it that way. What are you laughing about, Tony? Because we're we're missing something here, and I don't want to stoke the Knicks heat fire, even though I do. But I, I want to say something, and I think we're supposed to have a conversation about Jalen Brunson. Hmm. Jalen Brunson's one of the best players in the NBA. Right. He is. Like, yes. Have you seen his stats the last month? Uh, 34, 42, 45, 61, 30, 45, 43, 40, 39, 40. Like, he's an incredible player. Preach. More impressive. Is that the than conversation? That. No, the conversation is <laughs> the conversation is he's one of the best players in the East, now leading a Knicks team to, to Dan's 90s point. Feels like the 90s again. The Knicks are the two seed in the entire conference. And we're talking about OJ again. We're it does feel like the yeah. 90s. Do you know, we are back, by the I, way. The best compliment I can give to Jalen Brunson is that my boyfriend's made me watch a lot of Knicks games in the last five years we've been dating. And for the first time, I actually don't hate it. Wow. The, the question that I pose, <laughs> the conversation I want to have is if the Heat do end up getting out of the playoff, uh, the play ins, and it's, it's Knicks Heat. Two seven. Why do you sound like this? Is it from yelling? Oh, it's been a long day. It's yelling. At, what do you mean? We just started. What do you mean? It's been a long day. We had, weekend. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. We had a lot of Tony tonight. So we were filming last week. Uh, I was in the back end of a little bit of a cold. And then Saturday night, I mean, UFC 300, biggest card on the planet, biggest night for MMA ever. Uh, we were screaming. We had a live show at Grails presented by Cuervo. Uh, so we were screaming there. It was it was uh, a big night. A lot of screaming. <laughs> excuse me. Big night. Dan, when your week ends, Tony's begins. Out of point. Mean, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's what we do around yeah. here. Mm -hmm. But what I want to have, the conversation I want to have, Dan, is are we sure that the best player in a Knicks Heat series is Jimmy Butler? Jalen Brunson uh, will not get the reputation that you wish for him to have until he starts winning playoff series. He is better than anybody thought he was. Uh, better than I think the Knicks thought he was. Better than Dallas thought he was. Well, better, they got rid of him. Better than and yeah, they 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 got rid of him, but. <laughs> but at the time they got rid of him, next to nobody was saying that that was a disaster. And with Kyrie Irving replacing his usage rate, they're still pretty good and I'd say better than the Knicks. The funny part about the Jalen Jimmy conversation is that it's the same one for each player, right? Nobody thought Jimmy Butler was a player who could lead the Heat to the type of success that they've had. But he's done it. Now he's done it. Right. Jalen Brunson is kind of the next guy of that mold that has led a team beyond where anyone anticipated. But thus far, it's just in the regular season. With Jimmy Butler in the Heat, it's been they've been just about an average team in the conference over the last several years. They got to the finals as a five seed. They got to the finals as an eight seed. The aberration was the one year that it's they not, were the one it's seed. It's not uh, just that the players don't find the regular season to be worthy of their time. You will not have any kind of legacy based on anything he's done this season. And I'm just as awed by him as you are. But the way that Damian Lillard got the reputation that he did was shots in the playoffs. When you're playing these games that are regional games to a lot of people, 
They don't pay attention during the regular season. Basketball heads absolutely have no confusion about how good Jalen Brunson is. But now is the time for everybody to discover it because a whole lot of people are going to be tuning in for the first time to see what he can do at the end of games when his team is going to be overmatched. His team is going – like, if they have to play Philadelphia, that's a disaster, Stugatz. That's Philly a, will be the favorites, that, I that's, think. That's, yes. I mean, outside of Boston, they can't have a worse match. Up. They don't want that to start because they don't have the best player on the floor. Especially when you consider the size situation. And that, to me, is what's remarkable about Jalen Brunson. Look at this league. By the way, this sentence that I'm about to say shocked me when I heard it yesterday. It's, it's this is the worst Victor Wembanyama is going to look for his oh. entire career. Did he, oh score, he, scored, he scored 17 points in three minutes the yes. other day? Yes. yes. And so the league is turning into aliens at every <laughs> position. Look at a men Thompson with the Rockets. He's going to be a point guard. And that guy's a ridiculous athlete. Halliburton look what too, Jalen Brunson is doing at six feet tall. The amount of skill required to keep schooling these guys who are longer and more athletic than him and continuously doing it. The problem is... Again, in a seven-game series where you're talking about size and uh, you can sort of intimidate him. You can affect him more so than you can, let's say, uh, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, who does a lot of the same things, gets to his spot, yeah. finds a way to get a shot off, and, and, or maybe gets fouled, longer, more athletic than Jalen. And so at some point, the answers all, or the question is always going to be, is he big enough? Does he have that ability for three, four playoff series to take over at his size? And that's the question. I don't think the answer is yes. We have a lot of – we have sample sizes of smaller guys leading teams to – through the playoffs to the NBA Finals. I mean, I, he's not Allen Iverson, but the same questions were posed of Allen Iverson. He's six feet tall. How can he lead a team, be a number one on the team, and take him to the Finals? Obviously, we know what happened when he got there and when he got to be in the playoffs, but it feels like that archetype is now – it's almost like the small quarterback – where there was a moment like, wait a second, I think we can put a guy who's like 5'10 back there and he can kind of make something happen. It feels like we're seeing that now, like almost a resurgence of point guards being a little bit smaller, maybe making something happen. We know the matchup issue that obviously exists with the Sixers against the Knicks. The Sixers are overwhelming. You could argue they're the second best team in the conference because when Embiid is healthy, they've been dominant. For the Heat against the Knicks, the interesting part is... This year's roster is actually better situated to guard Jalen Brunson than last year's team because you saw a lot of minutes from Max Struess and Gabe Vincent who really struggled to guard Jalen Brunson. This year, there's a lot of long wings that play on that team. Terry Rozier is actually, as a guard, longer than what you had in Gabe Vincent. And the last time that the Knicks and the Heat played this regular season when they were scheming for Jalen Brunson, he was 5 of 18 from the floor for just 20 points. That's the worst game he's had over this last yeah, stretch. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't very good. Tony's saying, I don't think this is a resurgence, though. A player of this size hasn't won the championship since what? Isaiah Thomas? Like, when is the, a player of this size doesn't get to win the championship? It's well, not a thing. Wasn't Chris Paul, that's for sure. It's, it's not a thing. At 6'2, uh, I mean, it, there's not many. I mean, 6'3, Dwayne. You guys Wade. are forgetting, though, that Jalen Brunson, you can't measure heart. I mean, exactly. Thank you, Steve. I feel like you can. Thank you. I, I feel like I, mean, I can, technically you can. You're right. I feel but. like I can not only measure your heart, I can then put it next to a seven footer and that heart can look really small. Well, I yeah. might not be. A, a good thing. They've got a bigger heart, though. The seven footers yeah. got a bigger heart naturally. And large hearts are actually worse. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. On a medium sized heart. Well, so now you, so you what, do you, what, so nice what are you? So what are you? Small heart. Not small, but what like are you medium. alleging? You're yeah. alleging an enlarged heart? <laughs> no, not enlarging anything. I don't know. Uh, you mentioned small, and I want to play for you guys uh, the video here that I found fairly startling. It was universally mocked. Allen Iverson got a statue different than all the other statues that you've ever seen. I just don't think that by definition, because of its size, it qualifies as a statue. <laughs> I think it has to be a trophy, not a statue. It doesn't seem like, I don't know what the height of a statue has to be to qualify as a statue, but if it's half the size of Allen Iverson, is it indeed a statue? That goes on a coffee table. That's, that's not a, a statue. Yeah, that's a statuette, I believe. Ooh. Like it's a small, that's a Degas. That's not a Rodin. Well, what is, what is the uh, size of a statuette? What is the delineation that we're making between the size of a statue and statuette? 
ahead. I don't know. Put it on the poll here, Juju. Huh. At Levitard Show, do you know the size difference between a statuette and a statue? Because maybe this is a statuette. This was the only one, correct? It wasn't like there were a bunch of these and this was the smallest one. They said, we've got an Allen Iverson statue, and then it looks like a toy soldier. I think that all the statues in that area are the same size, but lacking that context, you see it. It looks almost like when they're making a building and they have the model yeah, of the yeah. building and you're yeah. like, yeah, yes. like, you know, the Zoolander, like how are we going to fit all these people in this building? Whatever. Send it for the, ants. Exactly. Right. Hmm. It looks like that. Like that's, is that the, that's the finished it's product? It's a model. Yeah. yeah. They say that statuette is small enough to stand on a table or shelf. And right. this is quite literally small enough to be on a table. You think Iverson's offended by that? Like he's smiling. He's selling it. He's selling that he's happy. It means a lot to him, but he's offended. Right. I mean, he, he didn't look better. offended. He didn't look offended. Well, he's selling it. I mean. Where are they putting this in the facility? Because, like, when I think of statue, I think of the Michael Jordan statue <laughs> yeah. outside of the United Center. Like, that is. I think of Rocky. Yeah, that too. Good statue. That's a statue. That's a statue. Imagine yeah. if the Rocky yeah. statue was this size, though. No one's oh. asking for the Lincoln Memorial here, all right? But it's a little, it's a little small. Out of curiosity, Stu Gatz. Allen Iverson strikes you as the type who just goes along with things organizationally. Like fakes it a lot that yeah. Allen Iverson Richard, Dan. Uh, that shows <laughs> shows fake enthusiasm for inauthentic things. You believe uh, I don't because uh, that's I I I if think if he didn't like it he would have said something well, I right. Ju I just think of him <laughs> as being one of the more authentic athletes, most most him or herself of all athletes, and so uh, given the amount of trouble that he had in general with Philadelphia management. And uh, given that they don't give many statues in general in Philadelphia, do are there across the sports teams, all of them? Are there five statues across all the sports teams? Nick Foles has a big statue in yeah. Philadelphia. What? I mean, yeah. Super Bowl MVP. <laughs> what? He does, yeah. Where? It's the Philly special statue. I don't know exactly where it is. I assume it's near the stadium, though. This one was so bad because they took – like the most iconic Allen Iverson moment, either this one or the step over, right? So I, and he did it against Michael Jordan. And then you turned it into this little tiny doll where I'm like, imagine Michael Jordan looking at that thing and just kicking it over and being like, ha, ah, I can't believe he got me with that I, move. But I now wonder it's so how tiny. many people remember the fact that at, in his debut at the top of the key against Michael Jordan and what was supposed to be signaling something of a changing of the guard, he crossed over Michael trying to guard him while clearly traveling. Stop that. Clearly yeah. carrying Look, did you the see ball. what Did you see what Izzy was doing? He said it was a palm. It he was, was not palming, a palm. He, well, it was he not got stopped. away. That. That's how he was able to do that to Stop Michael that. Jordan. Yes. Wait a <laughs> minute. So that's uh, that's not just a Nick Foles statue. That's also the Doug Peterson statue yes. as well. The Both yes. What did they yeah. make well, that? It, Doug yeah. Peterson is a statue bigger <laughs> than Allen Iverson. Uh, and <laughs> I think Nick we Foles. We can narrow it down to within the last five years, probably. I, I don't remember them saying anything about, hey, we're building a statue for Nick Foles and Doug Peterson. <laughs> There's a lot of baseball statues in Philly, Dan. A lot of baseball. There have been conversations in Philadelphia about replacing the Rocky statue with a statue of Jason Kelsey. That is blasphemy. I'm sorry. He's definitely I mean, getting a statue. I mean, oh, he's getting a statue, but not to replace the no, Rocky statue. It's never replace the Rocky bigger, statue. It's right. going to be bi like bigger than you know actual size. It's going to be like the opposite of the Allen Iverson one. They're going to make it like two times as big. <laughs> three times as big. His statue has to be the costume from the Super Bowl parade, right? Ooh. <laughs> shirtless in a suite. Shirtless in a suite. No, not yeah. shirtless. No. Shirtless with. Uh, they should use actual human hair on the belly. <laughs> <laughs> becomes expensive at that point. Then. Come on, That's man. actually a good idea. It becomes expensive at that point. Yeah, at that point. Yeah. Too. Come on. You know how there um, are statues far. where it's like good luck to rub part of it, like the the Lincoln statue in Springfield, Illinois. Apparently, it's good luck to rub his nose, so his nose is like copper, yeah. and like. People have been rubbing it so, like, the finishes come off. We were in Ireland and we saw a statue of this woman with, like, the biggest boobs you've ever seen. And people, I think, touched the boobs because they were, like, a different color. How many baseball players hmm. do they do in Philadelphia? Steve Carlton, Mike Schmidt, do they have a, a bunch of others? Like, who are the other Phillies that would be? Mike Schmidt has a statue. I'm not certain if, uh, if Lefty does. 
Steve Carlton won yes. 300 games and doesn't have a statue? Well, he's, got, it out. he's got a statue. He sure I, he does. I, I thought of Stugatz uh, yesterday when uh, that guy caught the Manny, that Dodger fan caught the Manny Machado home run ball and then did the old switcheroo and threw, a, boy. threw a different <laughs> baseball on the field. How did they find the boob statue? Yeah, so. the, boob statue. the internet is amazing that way, Jessica. <laughs> way to go, video. You'll find anything. That was so fast. You, you don't think Lewis has boobs always on his screen? Definitely a tab open. You, you, oh, don't, yeah. you don't think there's just a, a tab open of statue boobs? Statueboobs.com. I think he just knows the public art in Dublin very well. <laughs> He's like statueboobs.com. <laughs> he, he makes it like art but make it sports, but he art but make it boobs. Is that what uh, Lewis does? Best year for boob statues ever, Dan. Stugatz, how do you feel about... Lefty has a statue, Dana. I know, Jessica okay. just mentioned that. Well, I was just that. confirming it. So does Connie Mack. Uh, Connie. Mac. The manager. <laughs> oh. No news on nails yet, though. Checking it out. Joe Frazier. You yeah. can't give Lenny Dykstra a statue. Well, I mean, it's their city. Their Crucky? statues. Yeah. Crucky's has to have a cigarette in his mouth. Crucky should have one by like that big Reading, whatever it's called, the food court. Ready market. <laughs> the, the famous Crucky story is just a woman coming up to a, him at a party with a cigarette and going, You shouldn't be smoking. You're an athlete. He says, I'm not an athlete. I'm a baseball player. <laughs> Baseball Kenny, players should be fat again. Yeah. It's Kenny Powers. That's what that line is for. It's such a great Kenny well, Powers Kenny line. Powers is actually based on John Rocker. John Rocker, <laughs> racist, racist John Rocker is the Kenny Powers, uh, got the Kenny Powers treatment. But we've gone somehow 23 minutes without talking about Stugatz's beloved uh, masters. And it would appear that uh, your boy Scotty Scheffler is better than everybody by a good amount. Like you guys were telling me for so long, it's going to be Rory. It's going to be Sergio, all of these young people. And it's not. It's this guy. Well, he's young, although he doesn't look young. He's 27. He looks like he's 37. Uh, maybe 47, but he was Dan. It was Tiger like from this standpoint. He's not Tiger. People are making that comparison. They're talking about is this guy going to be better than Tiger? He, he's a bad putter, correct? He's he's, he's a, extraordinary at, at ball striking, but terrible at putting. He's an improved putter. He's gotten better at putting. Where he is the best at, and perhaps the best I've ever seen, is tee to green. He is always on the green in regulation, which means he's putting for birdie and most likely getting a par if the birdie putt doesn't go in. But to have two masters, to have two green jackets at the age of 27, to finish second, I believe, at the U.S. Open, the Open Championship, and the PGA Championship, uh, to have all the victories that he has, uh, he is certainly on track to being one of the all-time great golfers. It's very impressive because... To win that tournament, when you're the overwhelming favorite to win that tournament and actually go out and do it and win it and win it the way he did, man, that is tight. Do I have this wrong, though? Because for 10 years, it feels like you guys have been trying to sell me on the latest the new guy who's going to be the special thing. Yes. And this is not the guy people were talking no. about. No. It was Jordan Spieth. It was Brooks Kepka. They had it their separate Thomas. runs right. that looked kind of like this. It feels like Scotty Scheffler is kind of settling in, though. He's not going to have fall off like Jordan did after that one sort of choky hole. I forget that what tournament that was. Uh, it seems like Scheffler just stays there and doesn't fall off like Rory does randomly. Uh, Spieth did that at Augusta. It was the 12th hole at Augusta. He did it twice, actually, where he put it in the water, and he hasn't been the same since. So, How'd your prediction on Tiger Woods go? Not well. Hey, he made the cut, Dan. Tiger Woods should be offered a golf cart. I'm serious. He should be afforded a golf cart. Wow. Because if like you this. want your sport to stay relevant and you want Tiger to compete in these tournaments, the reason he's not competing is because he has to walk. And Augusta is very, very hilly. And it is tough at, at his age, Dan, with his body in this physical condition for him to walk those holes. I've seen him try to walk those holes. It's very difficult. Give him a golf cart. If he can cart. From shot to ball, shot to ball, shot to sure, ball, sure, he has a chance of winning sure. 10 more you know majors. What? I'll do you I mean, one better. Giving him a 15-stroke lead. <laughs> it is time for Stugatz to share his game notes. No one in the media will tell you what happened better than my boy Stu. Weekend observations brought to you by Miller Lite. 
Great taste, just 96 calories available for delivery. Dan, we haven't seen him play since 2022. I, for one, am not concerned. He'll be 47 when the next NFL season starts. Again, not concerned. Many thought he'd never play again, even though me and Billy told you he would most definitely play again. Well, Dan, over the weekend, guess what? He left the door open. He said he's open for business and that he's still in NFL shape. And Dan, just like that, make no mistake about it, Tom Brady is back. Exciting. It really is interesting to watch how he and Peyton Manning are going to compete for dollars the next 10 years. Peyton Manning just signed a 10-year deal with ESPN. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, Tom Brady's saying, yeah, but I don't have to do 10 years. I'll do, I'll, I'll do a, a, a season of games, 17 games. And play in a few. <laughs> maybe, maybe play in a few. He actually said he's. if the call comes, it depends on who calls. He'll go out there and be a mercenary. I love that the Patriots are an option now. It would be great. They're not an option. No, no they they're were an one option. Of his options, yeah. yeah, they're definitely an option. Yeah. Belichick's no longer there. We were running a scenario, Stu, last week when we heard the news where Tom was like getting out ahead and he was calling every team that Belichick was going to interview for and be like, by the way, oh. if there's an opportunity in the season, I might be interested. Bill can't be there, though. But not if he's our coach. Exactly right. <laughs> it's a reason to not hire him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> May explain some things. Stugat spent the weekend with Belichick. Well, I didn't spend the weekend with Belichick. Belichick delivered the pregame speech to the Northwestern women's lacrosse kit, uh, team. You wow. spent the weekend with you. You came in well, here and you said. He was the I third was, best coach on the I, field that day. I was watching him. He was <laughs> sitting under a tree on the phone. And, uh, he yes, was, yeah. And you said he was the third best coach, that you were second. Yes. Oh. Who oh, was Northwestern playing give an against? Order. Were they fourth? You're first. You were first. I assumed you were second. My Kelly bad. Amante Hiller, one or two, depending on the day. What? Close second me. She's one. Belichick third. Ohio State coach fourth. I will say this. You assured us that if Belichick was there, he was going to be a guest on God Bless Football this week. So did that happen? or? Well, he was on the phone under a tree. Hmm. I'm working on it. Tiger. Shooting a career worst in a major tournament. Tiger, I told you not having sex wouldn't help. Should have just had the sex, right? He finished a tons in, of he sex. Finished in last place. Yeah. He might have not made the cut, though. Well, he made the cut. At least made, I'm saying if he would have had sex, maybe he wouldn't no, have made Dan the cut. But Dan does his thing with last place, and technically he's ready. He made the cut, though. Jordan Spieth would have loved to be there over the weekend. Okay, but when they tallied up all the names at the end of the tournament, his was the last one on the leaderboard. A lot of people like Lebitard laughing at Tiger Woods for his performance at Augusta. Luckily for Tiger, he can go home and laugh about it in one of his five green jackets. You, of course, know what that means, right, Dan? What does that mean? It means Tiger always has the last laugh. Laugh all you want. Go ahead. Chuckle fest. Ha, ha, ha. Last place. Can't walk. He's getting old. You know what he does? He puts on a green jacket, and he laughs at you. Huh? I wasn't laughing at him. I was huh? just pointing out that uh, he finished in last place. I'm the, not... the red with his new logo did not look right. Yeah. It's hard to wear red when you're plus 14. I know, but the, <laughs> a new Tiger logo instead of the Nike swoosh. You're laughing at him. I didn't laugh at him. Last you're, laugh, you're, Tiger, though. You're laughing at him. I just heard you laugh. Tiger's at him. laugh is after his laugh, yeah. Dan. It's always laugh. He hated playing with that guy on Sunday, right? Oh, good stand. <laughs> Never thought I'd live long enough to see Nick fans arguing on the last day of the season about whether or not they should get the two seat. What a time. They should have lost that game. <laughs> they really should have lost that Insane game. Insane to go win that in overtime playing DiVincenzo 50 plus minutes He's to good. do it. Yeah. Nobody loves a regular season like Tom Thibodeau. The oh. Italian kid from Ohio. Is uh, is Magic Cavs going to be played on like free TV or something? like uh, NBA free TV form. 2. <laughs> 
the rare moving day where just about everyone stayed put. The only guy that moved was Colin Morikawa. Know what the M in Morikawa stands for, Dan? I do not. Moving. That would, it was right there that for That would you, make Dan. sense, yes. Yeah. I was right, it was right there for me. Got an update on Andrew McCutcheon. Still playing. He's a pirate. 300 homers. Kutch. Hall of Famer? Hmm. He made the Pirates relevant in this era. Do I they call yes. him Kutch? Yes, I, well, the, Kutch, pir- yeah. the Pirates aren't relevant in this era, though. But if you were to name a Pirate, he would be the one. You're That's right. true. For the last, yes. like, 20 years. That should get Even you when into he the wasn't hall. a Pirate yeah. for a few years. Do they call him <laughs> Kutch, though? Yeah. They do, of yes. Of course. Yeah, everyone knows that. The Sunday night after the Masters ends makes me sad. Top five saddest Sundays of the year. Number five, the last Sunday of summer break. Number four, Master Sunday. Number three, the last Sunday after the Christmas, New Year's holidays. Number two, Super Bowl Sunday. And number one for my poor wife, Abby, every Sunday. So you're just doing Sunday night, though, right? Because the Super Bowl, the day of the Super Bowl, you're fine. It's just you I feel get sad. Sloppy. No, the whole week I'm sad because conference championship games are done. You have one lonely football game left. You're sad all of Radio Row week? Yeah, the whole week. Because you wake football... up on Master Sunday just sad? Yes. Because I'm not going to see the thing I love so much for another year. It makes me sad. Don't smile because it's going to be over soon. <laughs> smile because it, it's well, not happened yet. That's how you say it. I think it. that's the saying. That is exactly that's We don't know the rest it. of it. Just continue. Baseball and your unwritten rules. Get over yourselves. Top prospect, Jackson Holiday, is one for 15 to start his career. Hey, Jackson, do it in the majors. If you like a heart attack with your save, Craig Kimbrell is your guy. It's never easy. Also a tough name. Golden State Warriors. The rare win or blow up the team game. A lot on the line. (laughs) Boston, New York, Cleveland, Orlando, Indiana, Philadelphia, Oklahoma City, Minnesota, LA Clippers, Dallas, Phoenix. All of you do it in the postseason. Wow. Dan. We were so close. I believe the closest we've ever been to a Masters Champions dinner menu that included gefilte fish. Is it gefilte? I thought it was gefilte. I thought, I don't know how tomato, to Tomato, tomato. It. it doesn't matter. It's always funny. Okay. It is a funny phrase. I agreed. Observations we were so close to having if Max Homa won the Masters. Dan, you know what the B in Butler Cabin stands for? I do not. It stands for brisket. Dan, you know what the M in Master stands for? Meshugana. Man, Max. I thought you were going to go for matzo ball soup. <laughs> the start of 60 minutes. The rare jump scene that you know is coming and still gets you every single time. It was jump scare, not seen. The joke doesn't work if you don't. No, I get it. Thank you, Izzy. Appreciate it. (laughs) The Atlantic having an article titled Democracy Dies Behind a Paywall. Behind a Paywall. The Atlantic. The Stugats is so very strong in you. Cavs. Magic. First round matchup. If this series was a movie, it would go straight to DVD. They say the Masters doesn't start until the back nine on Sunday. Scotty Scheffler didn't get that message. Seth Davis tweeting that he and Mark Pope can go line for line at reciting Hamilton lyrics is the last thing I'd want to see if I'm a Kentucky fan. I want my coach to be too busy that he's never seen Hamilton. Seriously, what is he doing? (laughs) You think Calipari has seen it? The only Hamilton I want is Leonard. (laughs) Eight golfers shot under par over the weekend. Do you know who wins the Masters every year, Dan? 
Augusta. I didn't give you a chance there. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing crazier than Scotty Scheffler winning two Masters before turning 28 is the fact that Scotty Scheffler is only 27. 28, yeah. <laughs> He Come doesn't. On, he he does look 48. He does look older. The Dodgers fan that threw back a fake home run ball while keeping the real home run ball. How'd he play, man? And then doing interviews afterward. <laughs> a nominee. I would have been fine with them just turning down the broadcast and just interviewing him for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. A nominee. For the least surprising headline of the year, an agency led by Bad Bunny is facing sanctions. Whoa. What, what, what happened? Why do you think Bad Bunny? What did Bad Bunny ever do to Why you? Bad Bunny do to deserve it just, sanctions. It wasn't surprising. What's the deal I mean, with it's that? not what good bunny, mean? it's Bad Bunny. Yeah. Okay. Conejo Malo. Bad Bunny. Okay. Mm -hmm. John Rahm. Looks like he's having difficulty living inside his own skin. He does. John, live wasn't made for you. It was made for guys who don't give it. Guys who are past their primes. Guys that have gambling debts. Or, if you're Phil Mickelson, all of the above. Lefty. Death. Taxes. And Tommy Fleetwood. In contention Sunday at Augusta. The things you do driving around the Midwest on a gummy in the passenger seat. Top five athletes, that Kenota rock band. OLI, John Jett, ML Carr, Razor Ramon. I'm sorry, what, so, so what are those, what, what's that? That Kenota rock band, Tommy Fleetwood. Okay, but what are the, Joan Jett or, or Benny and the Jets? Joan Jets. What do you okay, mean? I don't, I Benny don't and know. the Jets a song. John Jett sounds like Joan Jett. Number She's a rocker. Yes. Tommy Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac. Okay, sorry. Number five, Kareem Rush. Number four, Max Crosby, Kenny Stills, Steve Nash, and Vince Young. Wow. Okay, all of them. All right, nicely Thank done. Thank you, everyone. That one yes, got an ovation yes, back that's here. Pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Number that's three, unlike. Marty Fish. Number two, David Boston. Number one, Johan Santana. Santana band? Sorry. Absolutely, is, is Dan. Santana, Absolutely, I mean, Dan. I Come think of on, Santana as an individual no, Carlos artist. Santana, the individual. Oh, Santana, the band built here? around him. So upset at you. I think of Santana as an individual, not as a band. What do you want me to tell you? I don't know. The Santana, Carlos Santana is in the Hall of Fame, isn't he? The, is not the, the whole band is. Carlos Santana, the first baseman? <laughs> you think Johan did enough, huh? <laughs> hmm. Heat Sixers. The rare lose or go to the Mecca game? John Rahm, you took $600 million smeared in blood. Do me a favor. Spare me your outrage about the playing conditions at Augusta. Hey, John. Know what $6 million buys you? Me never caring about anything you ever have to say again. Vern Lundquist, it's been an honor listening to you, sir. Tip of the cap. Wow. A sir, an honor, and a tip of the cap. The wow. holy Deserved trinity uh, for a guy who looks like a soap bubble. Is Santana First year what are you now, doing, man? man? Come, on. Come on. That's a looks Leave like Vern tournament. No, that is a that's a seed he got in our tournament one time. Vern Lundquist looks like a soap bubble. This is why Billy canceled looks like, because you're a little offensive. A lot of body shaming. It looks like a soap bubble. I don't, what do you want me to tell you? Boban's listening. Boban or Boyan. Bench is cleared in Dodgers Padres. Why do the benches clear in baseball? Like, do you think the guys in the bullpen jog in thinking, what the hell are we doing here? Honestly, it's a waste of a jog. No one's going to fight. Speaking of hell, our Bryles, Dan, those are the weekend observations.
with you Think of all the germs You could have gotten worms Think of d If he saw you being rude Scarfing down your food Or if he heard you fart In the studio that day Once more The chips you chose to chew An open bag would do So why were you eating your hand And it's time to reprimand To think you do it all the time I'll never look the same at you Cause it was in so deep You swallowed a knuckle or two You may have to join the ringer Why did you have to lick your finger? Did you have to? Did you have to? Did you have to lick your finger? How do you imagine, Stugatz, that the South Carolina women's basketball team experienced Caitlin Clark on Saturday Night Live? Um, probably not well. It's it's still it's a great thing that she appeared there. It's great that uh, the exposure for the women's game, but probably like, hey, why aren't we on Saturday Night Live? I would imagine yes. that's, that is what they're thinking. I wanted to clean something up from earlier in the show as well. You guys mentioned associating Pierce Brosnan with heists. I do too, but outside of the Thomas Crown Affair. Great movie. Has there been another heist movie that Pierce Brosnan has done? That you associate Pierce Brosnan? Because I too associate him with the idea of being someone who hosts a, a heist show. But the Italian job was a heist and it was not, uh, I don't think that Pierce Brosnan, I, I feel like De Niro has done more of those than Pierce Brosnan has. I just, I feel like physically Pierce Brosnan looks like a guy that, did I say his name wrong? <laughs> who is that? I think you put I don't a know. D in his last I name I probably somewhere. did, but he seems like a guy that would... He would lead a group of people mm-hmm. into a heist. He does. He does. He was in a movie called After the Sunset, which was great. Where some diamonds are thefted great? there. Yeah. Oh, it was great. What's the score on that? Was it not? Just, I can't see it there. The what, Rotten Tomatoes Rotten score? Tomatoes score. It's right there on the bottom. So I don't know. Right I need there to, to the watch right, the Billy. Thomas Crown Affair. I still haven't seen so it. So good. Great it, scene. I, when I think of Pierce Brosnan, there's this... Um, Internet uh, TV critic Brian Grubb, his whole bit is every time there's a heist, he reposts it with a picture of Pierce Brosnan just looking hot in like some nice white linen sh- pants. So I think oh, of Pierce yeah. Brosnan whenever I think of heists. Guys, and he's a Bond. I have something to ask you because I don't think that I can pull this off, but I have to pull this off. I have a wedding that I'm attending in Mexico in the summer mm. on the beach, and Mancy, it is Mancy. prime Elo time. linen time. Mm-hmm. But I'm not a linen guy. Oof. Everybody's but, a linen guy. You got to go in with the swagger of being a linen guy. That's the thing. I feel like I ha- I have to embrace the linens in this entire trip, yeah. destination wedding. I, it has to be a lot of linens, yep. but I don't have any linens right now, and I'm not I'll sure take that you. I'm about I'll take you to my life. spot. I'll take you to my spot. Izzy, what are you shaking your head about? I mean, I think linens are a little odd, right? So you're talking the middle of the summer oh. in Mexico. And yes, mm-hmm. like you're it's going to be hot. So you want cool clothing, yeah. but you sweat in that. You're still you might get that stuff sticking to you. It might become see-through at some point. It's gonna be very yeah. Uh, dis- yeah, it's it's kind of gross. Well, if I learned anything at working at Victoria's Secret, you wear nude colored underwear when you're wearing white. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, a, what you what learned. A great huh? lesson for you to learn <laughs> from Victoria's Secret. Yes. Is that, am I wrong? Um, I don't know. Do you have any nude I didn't work colored? There. Do you have any <laughs> nude? <laughs> do you have any nude colored underwear? I'm just not, picturing him giving this advice not as to other yet. women. I also knew how to measure, but we weren't allowed to do that. Huh. That would lead to problems. Interesting. <laughs> Explain. You didn't how, answer. How do you, how do, you do it? Measure? Yeah. yeah. You have to. You, you take the measuring tape. You go. You measure over the top first. And then you go and you measure, you know, center, and then the difference, and you know, it's a whole thing. But you never got the opportunity. No, I no, no. not a lot. No No one's yeah. You didn't answer the question of what the rating was, Rotten Tomatoes rating on After the Sunset, which you described. Rotten Tomatoes, as we all know, big political place. I'm not going to take a quiz on what the Rotten Tomatoes rating is. Because there's the critic score, which we all know critics can be bought, and that's it looks like 18 percent. That's the critic. That's the crit. That's the critics. The audience score 52. All right. I'm telling you. Coin toss. 
Mm-hmm. I think you'll enjoy a nice crisp linen suit. Oh. And you know who yeah. knows suit? No. his linen suit? No, 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 no linen no, suit. No, no, Absolutely no, not no, linen suit. Not wearing a suit? On, no. the beach? on the beach? No chance. Crazy. I was, I was I, arguing I that I should be... I assumed it was be... a formal wedding, but I mean... I no, guess it's, it's, a, it's the beach. Nothing's formal. That's a whole other thing that has is led to problems. Is it beach problems. cocktail or like <laughs> casual beach or whatever the dress code is? There's this expectation that I'm to dress nice outdoors on the beach part, and then I'm to change to go to the reception and dress differently. And I said, friends... This is on the beach. I will be wearing shorts. And I was quickly told, no, you will not. Oh, my God. Please wear a linen seersucker or, like, shorts with, like, a blazer. Oh, my God, Billy. I'm getting all kinds of mixed signals because they're also saying, you know, either barefoot or sandals. I'm like, barefoot or sandals is shorts. I'm not wearing pants, but they're telling me I have to wear pants. You got to wear pants. It's a Remember, what we're missing here is we're looking at the different levels of linen, right? Seersucker linen is not Mexico linen. Right, but Caribbean it would look linen so is totally Billy different. What's it? Mexico linen? Mexico linen is like a nice cut off shirt, right? Not full way, not all the way down, not a long sleeve shirt, mm-hmm. a regular shirt, button, couple buttons down. You're in Mexico. You're showing a little bit of a chest. Mm. I was gifted this shirt with parrots on it, and I was told no, there is no out. circumstance no in parrots. which I can wear that to wear the, the wedding. Wear the parrots. Hmm. How about this? You're traveling to Mexico. It's costly. You need a passport. You're going to a different country. It's on a beach. It's going to be 95 degrees. I'll wear what I want. How's that sound? Shorts, flip flops, whatever I want, I'm going to wear it. Put it on the poll, please. Juju at Lebitard Show is an 18 critic score and 52 audience score. A coin toss. 50-50. 50-50. <laughs> Can we all, look, I've seen it already. I'm happy to do this if the class wants to do it. Let's all watch After the Sunset tonight. Down. And then we can come back and discuss tomorrow. You're, Before or after the WNBA draft. It's fun. It's a fun little flick. How about we wow. choose? Where is it? it? Where do they have it? Ooh. I'd imagine there's a lot of downtime in the WNBA draft, like most drafts, right? Yeah, commercial breaks. What would it take? What would it take to trade for the number one pick? There's no <laughs> circumstance in which a team <laughs> you would, don't have enough. There's, you, no, there's, no, there's enough. not enough. That's right? a great sports nobody, topic. Nobody it has is. enough. Great. What Who has it, the number one pick? What would it take? Oh, Indiana. <laughs> what would it take? Sorry, I was asking. I'm trying to get into it. It's I mean, Indiana, we've said it like yeah. a lot. Oh, we've oh, said it on this show. I confused Iowa with Indiana. Yeah. Just Same was, market. Just Same market. Did you watch the Michael Che <laughs> thing with Caitlin Clark this no. week? Okay. Yeah. Well, well, then you would have seen it on that, too. Yeah, I didn't watch it. She made a joke about Indiana fever sounding like an STD. Let's get some which real. Which I've always thought, by the way. I'm glad someone finally yeah, said it. Yeah. Let's get some real basketball knowledge here. Sounds like something you get at Little Five. Sorry, Dan. From Izzy. Uh, Stan Van Gundy says that Luka Doncic is the greatest offensive player in NBA history. Uh, <laughs> I don't find Stan to be prone to hyper. I don't find Stan to be prisoner of the moment. Stan is watching a history of basketball, and he is saying that the most efficient, more efficient than 2018, Harden, Michael Jordan, any of them, that Luka Doncic is the best offensive player he's ever seen. I wanted to argue, but the same way I wanted to argue with Mark Jackson when he initially said that Steph Curry and Klay Thompson were the best shooting backcourt of all time, and then I'm like, but it's a little hard to argue because what he's saying, I mean, we can we can split hairs, but what he what he's saying, when I say that we're watching once in a lifetime players, nine of them in the NBA right now, I don't think I have it wrong. Did you ask Stan if he's seen Michael Jordan? Stugatz did. <laughs> I did. <yep. laughs> Just making sure. No, I, I heard that. That's how I argue. Um, here's the thing about Luca, and until Stan said that, I hadn't really had this thought. Um, but I was thinking about how you defend Luca, and I literally said, well, just start standing next to him when he starts his shooting. And I'm like, how ridiculous would you look as a defender if you just, oh, he's starting his shooting motion. Let me run next to him so that maybe I can block. It's, when you have to think that way, it tells you the guy is ridiculously unstoppable. There was a point in his rookie season where I thought, oh, that jumper, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall off. It's not going to be consistent. It's just gotten better and better. It's a little flick of the wrist, and he can fade away in any direction. Oh, and by the way, if you get him going that way, he can just hit a three-point finger roll and just, it's amazing the shots this guy hits. They look like trick shots. Izzy, I don't know if you'll agree with me here. He looks like the most effortless scorer. Yeah. And I think that's what, what differentiates kind of like guys you see going hard and their scores. And it's like, oh, yeah, he can get to the hoop whenever he wants. Luca gets to the hoop and it looks easy. Everything looks like he's because kind he doesn't of in have slow to blow motion. by you because he's so big. It's, the, it's, the, it's a combination of everything, right? Because when we talk about offensive players, we're talking about skill set, right? Because 
you give me an off, you tell me Shaq in his prime, that's a great offensive player. He only has one necessary move, but he's a great offensive player. What Luka does, he has the size. Whatever you try to take away from him, he has a counter for every single thing. When Kyrie Irving, who Kyrie Irving considers himself, you know, he, the savant, right? He loves, he knows basketball. He's on, on a different level. When he gives you props, like he did to Kevin Durant, you know, oh, that's the only guy who can do what I do when he was with the Brooklyn Nets. When he gives Luka props, and when you see him sort of just shine, like glow, when Luka does some amazing stuff, when you're impressing Kyrie Irving, I mean, that means you are on the top level of NBA skill people like of all time. Kyrie Irving, who by consensus, everyone seems to say is the best ball handler in the history of the sport. Like it doesn't, There's no question about it. It just doesn't seem like there's even a second place. Did you see Isaiah Thomas? When you watch Kyrie in person, it's sort of like those people who are so fast that it looks like their feet aren't hitting the ground the way he dribbles the basketball, where it's just from one space to another before you've even processed it in your mind. And with the Mavericks, I mean, the way that they handle their pregame shots, like Luka is not preparing at all for the game. He's, no, he's just shooting around. the ball 60 he's feet in the air. The he's doing time. headers. He's kicking the ball. He's doing chest bumps with the basketball to try to get alley-oops with guys. And against the Heat, he was doing the same thing. And then he came out and scored 13 points in eight minutes just absolutely effortlessly against a team that's second best in defensive rating over the last month. Real quick on Kyrie. Way to get that in there, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, real quick on Kyrie. It, he is... He is so skilled. You know what? Never mind. Keep All going. right. Perfect. I have something. <laughs> me, me and Stu Gatz have been talking Wait, back channeling that these guys never saw Pistol Pete. Nope. Okay. Pistol Pete what? basically had a string on the ball on his hand. You did Hello. see it? So much more. Listen. So much more so than everybody else. Yep. That his dad, who was his coach, by the way. Dan, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. His dad would drive the car and Pistol Pete would dribble the ball outside the door. Going 20 miles an hour. Amazing. I Stop. Mean, There's nobody. Nobody can do that. Nope. Nope. I did not have you schooling us, Tony, with Pistol Pete's ball handling, which I, uh, hey, why I felt like uh, he used both hands to dribble and was wearing a, 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 <laughs> you a, fool. a, 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 a belt. He both was wearing. A, he was wearing a. He did it while his dad was driving the car. His, his shorts mean. had a belt on them. <laughs> This is the Dan Levator Show with the Stugatz Podcast.